right, so we're here with uh, Brendan Schulman, the Vice President of Global Policy for DJI. Uh, at the potentially biggest drone event uh, in the US. Um, Brendan, can you tell us a little bit more about the challenges that are upcoming? I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on now with the FAA. People are expecting changes potentially as soon as the beginning of this summer. Um, I'm wondering, and I guess a lot of our viewers as well, is what may be uh, expected from the FAA this summer and how does that the does it impact the hobbyist drone pilot most of all? Right, right. So I, I, I think there's something coming from the FAA and there's something com coming from Congress. Uh, and those are two big important things for, for hobbyists and, and recreational users. Um, I'll start with the FAA, is yeah, that you asked sure. first. So um, FAA is for the past year, been working on remote identification. And uh, the idea there is that the government agencies, particularly the security agencies, mm -hmm. need to know who's flying a drone um, so that they can figure out whether the drone is a threat or not, and also to hold people accountable when, you know, in the rare instance when someone is doing something they shouldn't. Um, so there was an aviation rulemaking committee last uh, summer that I was on, and we spent a lot of time creating a report that identified different technology solutions, different policy considerations, including the needs of, of pilots to have privacy over where they're flying, which is very important to me. So I'm glad that's in the report. And the report basically is to help the FAA figure out what should the remote ID requirement be. And there's really a lot of things uh, to consider, everything from costs and burdens, what's it gonna, what's it gonna take to identify if you wanna cooperate and, and be responsible, as almost everyone wants to. Uh, will you have to log into a system? Will you just have to broadcast your ID? Um, really, there's a whole topic of discussion mm -hmm. that's gonna come to a head over the next few months with a proposal from the FAA. Yeah. Now, uh, DJI has launched their own solution for this problem as well, right? Uh, DJI Aeroscope. And I know last year you launched that in uh, both uh, Europe, in Brussels, as well as here in the US. Can you tell us a little bit how uh, that system is being received by the various governments? Yeah, it's, it's being very well received, uh, primarily because it works already with the vast majority of drones already being used. Um, so the idea behind Aeroscope is we wanted to help with this challenge of identifying drones which we believe can lead to good policy and, and safety and security uh, results for everybody. Uh, the challenge is to do it in a way that's minimally uh, burdensome and doesn't cost anything for all of our customers, just exists. Yeah. The way to do that is to build it into the existing uh, radio system of the drone. The drone already has telemetry being sent out and video to the ground station. And what we've done with Aeroscope is to put an ID information packet on top of that that can be decoded by the Aeroscope receiver. So we've solved the remote ID uh, challenge just using the existing technology. So it doesn't yeah. cost you anything, you don't have to do much, you can put in your name, your, your ID number when that exists on the government side, and then anyone who needs to get the remote ID, like an airport or law enforcement, can buy an Aeroscope receiver and have that information. So it avoids all the infrastructure costs, the burdens, uh, the privacy intrusions of having to log into a government server mm -hmm. and be recorded permanently across the country. It's a localized solution like a license plate. If your drone is in the area near someone who's concerned about it, like a law yep. enforcement officer, they can figure out who you are. And one of the benefits, I think, of Aeroscope is that it doesn't only tell you where the drone is located, but also tells you where the pilot is located, right? That's right. So e even before we have a, a government um, solution or a requirement for remote ID, it already is useful because with Aeroscope, you can see where the pilot is standing. So that, if it's just a matter of having a conversation like, hey, you really shouldn't be flying here, it's you know, not a good time of day, there's a lot of people, police officer can go and have a conversation with the person who's flying the drone. Instead of just seeing a drone flying around, being frustrated about not being able to talk to that person, and then going to city council and saying, we need, you know, the cops will do this, we need to ban the drones here because we don't know who's doing this, they're flying around, we can't even talk to them. So it's a solution that solves problems today even before the FAA or other governments come up with mandates. Yeah. Um, another topic perhaps, but uh, some of the larger companies uh, that are looking into uh, drones as delivery tools for packages have been pushing for hobbyist drones to also register the drones and possibly get uh, licenses, uh, making changes to uh, Section 336. Do you know if anything is up and coming from the FAA that may make it harder for drone enthusiasts to fly a Mavic Air or a, a Mavic Pro, for instance? Right, so this is the other thing that's going on, as we talked about at the beginning. So, so there's FAA, but then Congress. So, yeah. so six years ago, Congress passed a law um, promoted by the, FAA, the AMA, which uh, said that the FAA should not create 
new regulations for model aircraft. And there was a good reason for that law, which is to protect the innovation and the community that is operating uh, model aircraft safely. Um, six years later, there are a lot of concerns about who's a hobbyist, what's a community-based organization, what does it really mean to have a framework like that? And that requires clarification, in part because we need solutions like remote identification to apply broadly. Um, and a lot of people are frustrated that there's a statute that, that says that the FAA cannot regulate um, in, that, in that situation. Yeah. Um, so uh, people have called for what's called a repeal of Section 336, basically let's scrap it. Uh, I think that's the wrong outcome because then you have, what, everybody going to Part 107? It's never going to work to have people go to an airport to take a test. Yep. So although um, people are calling for that, that's not really a very uh, constructive suggestion. So what I've been working on with other industry stakeholders and the AMA and others is to try to figure out what should that reasonable outcome be. If we need a regulatory framework for drones, let's protect the things that need protection. So for example, knowledge testing is important and, and useful. We, we have a built-in knowledge quiz in DJI Go, as you probably know. Yep. We added that a few months ago. Um, so we believe it makes sense to do some kind of knowledge uh, tutorial, mm -hmm. and to have, but to have that easily accessible, not at the airport, not at a test center, but right online, electronically. Yeah. So the proposal that I'm working on would say, yeah, have, have a knowledge um, test or tutorial, but make it online, make it easy for people to get it done, uh, to learn what they need to learn and then move on. Yeah. And, and to also have other protections to make sure that the FAA doesn't um, go overboard with regulation. Then I think we're fine. So we don't, we don't need 336 if the end result of 336 is basically people operating safely under a reasonable set of rules. So that's my objective and we're working very hard with stakeholders in manned aviation world, with AMA and, and with our customers to try to propose that to Congress and we are making progress. So hopefully um, you know, by the time this bill, this FAA reauthorization bill comes into law, there will be a good framework for regulating drones, including recreational drones, and also protection for those community-based organization uh, frameworks where, where people are operating safely with really a minimum of, mm -hmm. of regulation, maybe just registration. It's uh, in interesting that you mention that because uh, I think it was only a week ago that in Germany uh, numbers were made public where uh, even though the drone market has grown overall tremendously, the number of incidents actually decreased and they said it was the result of improved education yeah. uh, to the hobbyist, mostly hobbyist drone pilots. Do you think there's an opportunity for DJI maybe to do more in terms of educating their users and their pilots? Yeah, and, and we're, we're big supporters of education. I think almost everyone wants to fly safely and responsibly. They sometimes don't know what that means. So one of the things we pioneered in the past few months is that DJI Knowledge Quiz. So right in the app, before you can take your first flights, you have to learn and pass a little bit of a quiz in terms of um, knowing the basic rules of safe operation. We started with the United States. We worked with the FAA on the questions and answers. Um, we then have since done Australia and yeah. uh, Germany or UK, I England believe. Or something. Yeah, I believe the UK, so. Germany will probably be next. So yeah. we're, you know, we're, we're going to expand that because I think as a, as a tool to educate people right I mean, they're about to fly, it's right in their face. It's not a box, in the box insert they could throw away or ignore. It's right there and they have to, and it's not hard, right? We really just want them to know what the rules are and to show that they know it. Yeah, and, and I think, yeah. And it may also prevent uh, stricter regulation in the future if right. the number of incidents actually go down for people. Exactly, yeah. I, you know, I think if, if people um, follow the rules, we have fewer incidents, fewer need for restrictions. Yeah. Because the, the rules ought to work and let people fly safely. Why, why wouldn't we want people flying safely? Yeah. It's, it's the few people who aren't that if we can educate and, and, and improve that, um, I think we'll end up with a good result. All right, well thank you so much for your time. I know uh, you have a busy week here in, uh, in Denver. Uh, thank you again. And, You're welcome, uh, thank well, you. See you soon. Yeah. Thank you.